what kitchen items are essential for you? And how is it different from the list that I provided? Maybe my list has some things that would be junk for you. Maybe that wooden spoon is too much or you don't drink coffee. So my whole coffee setup would be junk for you. You're listening to The Minimalist Podcast with Joshua Fields Milburn and T.K. Coleman. Thank you, Malabama, but I think you forgot somebody. Ladies and gentlemen, my best friend, Ryan Nicodemus, hey! is in the studio. Hey! 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 Oh, my. Oh! If it isn't my favorite. Oh, wait, Mr. <laughs> <laughs> if it isn't my favorite people. Wait, you can... No, that's our thing that we always miss. <laughs> <laughs> We've been doing that since fifth grade, man. Uh, on the private podcast, we were playing uh, My Boyfriend's Back, but for copyright reasons, we can't play that here. <laughs> But we we changed the lyrics to my best friend is back. We got a lot to talk about today, y'all. Coming up on this free public minimal episode, a caller has a question about how she might use the no junk rule to determine which kitchen items are essential. And let's get a list of minimalist kitchen essentials on the table, quite literally on the kitchen table. And another listener has a question about, what did that listener have a question about? Oh, about self-esteem and embarrassment and shame and decluttering all that embarrassment that other people are heaping onto her. And then we've got our lightning round segment, a fam's question, and a listener tip for you. You can check out the full two-hour maximal edition of episode 430. That's the complete episode, y'all, over on Patreon. It's where we answer five times the questions and we dive deep into several simple living segments. That private podcast episode is out right now. Just head on over to Patreon dot com slash the minimalist or click the link down in the description to subscribe and get your personal link so that our weekly maximal episodes play in your favorite podcast app. Your support keeps our podcast 100% advertisement free because sing along at home, y'all. Advertisements Advertisements suck. suck. Let's start with our callers. If you got a question or a comment for our show, we'd love to hear from you. Give us a call 406-219-7839 or email a voice recording to podcast at theminimalists.com. Our first question today is from Michelle. Hello, my name is Michelle. I'm calling from Orlando, Florida. As a previous Pampered Chef and Tupperware party goer, I've accumulated quite a bit of kitchen stuff. We are now eating healthier in our house, and I no longer do the baking I once did. Could you tell me in detail what you consider to be minimalist kitchen essentials? Thank you. I was thinking about this, Ryan, how one person's essentials Mm. are another person's junk. Mm -hmm. And so I started writing about this as I heard this question throughout the last week. I was just playing around with a little bit of an essay. And I want to read that in a moment. But as before I do, do you have certain essentials that really stand out to you? (laughs) Nothing out of the ordinary. But we don't bake a lot either. I mean, Mariah does, but we got a couple little baking pans. But I mean, if she was doing cookies and brownies. I don't know. What are your favorite baked goods, TK? Oh, man. Uh, I know you like some baked goods. <laughs> uh, you, you look, looking at my gut as you say, I, I know you, hey, brother, that's I know me. you like some baked goods. Hey, that's, just me, that's just me projecting, man. <laughs> but no, like, we, you know, she doesn't, she doesn't really do much more than that. So we have what we need. But like you said, my essentials are my essentials. That's right. Yeah. So I wrote this little essay called Another Person's Junk, and it goes a little something like this. This is a rough draft. One person's essentials are another person's junk. For me and my kitchen, I get value from my water kettle, coffee grinder, V60 pour over contraption, and a couple mugs for the perfect cup of coffee in the morning. A single stainless steel pan and a wooden spoon for cooking lunch and dinner at home. Half a dozen utensils, ceramic dishes, and pint-sized water glasses for enjoying simple meals. Cloth towels and a countertop paper towel dispenser for mitigating the mess. But my wife and daughter, they have different essentials. They find value in their toaster for sourdough breakfasts, a milk frother for morning time matcha lattes, a blender for lunchtime smoothies, a popcorn maker for once a week movie nights. That which is essential for them might be junk for me and vice versa. That is why it makes no sense to blindly follow someone else's list of so-called essentials. Anything they find value in, 
might get in your way. Their five spoons might be too little for them, but too much for me. Their espresso maker probably serves them well, but it would collect dust in my kitchen. They might find, they might not mind a super abundance of countertop appliances, but I prefer clutter-free counters in my home. Of course, my way is not the right way. It is merely the right way for me. And it could be totally inappropriate when considering my neighbor's preferences. And this is the problem I have with a question like Michelle's. I understand why she's looking for this. What is the rule that tells me, here are the things I should have in my kitchen. Here are the kitchen essentials. Well, my essentials are different from my wife. They're certainly different from Ryan. They're different from TK. And the essentials are what is essential for you. That's why we have the the no junk rule. In fact, there are two places you can go here. The first one is check out the minimalist rule book. It's free. You can download it, theminimalists.com slash rule book. The no junk rule helps you identify what is essential, what's non-essential but value adding, how does it enhance your life, and then what is junk. Everything you own in your kitchen and everywhere else in your house can fit in one of those three piles. The problem is that Ryan, if you handed me a bunch of baking sheets, I wouldn't have anything to do with them because I don't bake at all. And because I don't bake, they would be junk for me. They Mm. would get in the way. They would be clutter. For someone who's a baker, I'd be depriving them. It's absolutely essential for them to have the things to bake with. And so what is essential for you is going to be different from what's essential for me. Yeah. You know, one of the, the tricky things about life is that If everything were a matter of right and wrong, it'd be pretty easy. I mean, we'd have this information problem we'd have to solve, but for every decision we make, we could just figure out what's the wrong thing, process of elimination, just do the right thing. But the way life shows up more often is it gives us a hundred options, none of which can be dismissed as being wrong. It wouldn't be wrong to hang on to that pan. It wouldn't be right to hang on to that pan. It's all fair play. What do you do in that kind of context? And so I see that being similar to the problem that we're dealing with here. I think of that quote, all things are permissible, but not all things are profitable. And so we have to make the leap from looking at it in terms of what's the right way to be a minimalist versus what's the wrong way to be a minimalist and ask ourselves, what is the most profitable way for me to express my creativity in this context, right? And so if you eliminate the right or wrong paradigm on this issue, you kind of liberate yourself from any feeling of stress, anxiety, or guilt about screwing up. You can keep as much of that stuff as you want. So let's take that off the table. Now, what makes you ask a question like this? What makes you say, once upon a time, I needed all these things and I enjoyed using them, and now I don't use them as much as I used to. What do you guys think? What's making you ask that question? Is having that stuff around, stressing you out, making you feel burdened? Are you attached to it because of the way it served you in the past? Do you feel some kind of loyalty to that stuff? If you're keeping it around just because of what it used to be to you, it becomes a weight. But if you're keeping it around because you have a future use for it and you want to just evolve the way you use those tools, well, that's fair game too, but it's got to be up to you. I love the context you're setting, man, because you're like helping Michelle and many other people who are facing this. They're going from good and bad decisions to needed or not needed. And there is no right or wrong if something is needed or not. Um, as we've kind of been talking about this, it made me think like Mariah and I, we will definitely use the spontaneous combustion rule. That's like our go-to for sure, especially with kitchen stuff. Um, also, when we moved in to our place in Montana, it was a little smaller than what we had anticipated. But it was all right. Like we all, we took care of it. And um, especially with the kitchen stuff specifically, it was using that spontaneous combustion rule and letting stuff go. And then, you know what? Like as time goes on, sometimes Mariah's like, oh, I really wish I had this pan or that pan. It's like, okay, do you need that? She's like, oh, maybe not. And then like, it'll come up again and and comes up enough. It's like, all right, let's get that. But you know, I don't care what kitchen utensils you have or accessories or whatever, uh, air fryers. Uh, what else? Like a deep, they sell deep fry, like home little deep fryers, which is, you know, you put some tallow in there. I guess it's all right. But the thing is, is like, you know, you, you go back a century They still made all this food without all these gadgets and all these things. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And the list that I made for myself, I think most of these things were available a century ago. Mm -hmm. Whether it is the water kettle, the coffee grinder would be more of a hand grinder, but there's still, you know, 
I didn't say what kind of grinder it is, right? Mm -hmm. And my list is different from your list. What's essential for me? And by the way, what's essential for my 42-year-old self is different from, remember when we moved to the cabin in the middle of nowhere, we were using that rice cooker every single day for every meal. I don't use a rice cooker at all ever anymore. My wife does, and so she has one, but I don't have a desire to have a rice cooker. And so that is no longer essential. At one point it was, now it is junk. It would simply get in my way. If I live by myself with a rice cooker, it would just be taking up the countertop space. It'd be countertop clutter. One other thing that stands out to me, you know how we do these minimalist home tours on the private podcast and we send out a photo from a listener's kitchen or a listener's living room or their garage or hallway or whatever. And we look inside a listener's minimalist space and someone said, hey, here's my kitchen. I just moved in here. And what was beautiful is there was nothing on the counters. And the first comment I could tell was a joke because it was one of our patrons, right? The, The patron was like, Wait, do they do they ever cook anything at home? <laughs> now, they were joking as a, this is how the typical public would respond to this. Obviously, you're supposed to have all of your counters strewn with all of these kitchen essentials, right? And when you come over to someone's house, they don't have anything on the counters. Well, they must not cook at home. And my response to that was, to their joke was, yeah, to be fair, my kitchen counters look like this. They're completely blank except for a kettle. And yet I cook literally every meal at home. And I mean, yeah. I might eat out a couple times a month, but I'm cooking every single meal at home without a bunch of stuff on the counters. Yeah. It's totally possible when you question what is essential. Their essentials aren't necessarily your essentials. Yeah, you know, I believe that wealth is like water. It becomes stale when it stays stale for too long. But when you get it moving, when you get that energy circulating, it becomes life-giving. And one of the principles I abide by when it comes to holding on to things is never make a distinction between keeping it and using it. If I'm going to keep it, then that means I am committing myself to using it. And if I'm not going to use it, then I'm going to give it to someone else who can find a creative use for it. And what holds people back a lot from thinking this way is this fear that if I give it away, then there's gonna come a future moment where I might need it and I will regret giving it away. And for me, the abundance mindset is about believing that when I circulate the energy that is wealth, by giving it to those who truly appreciate it and truly need it. And I don't adopt that scarcity mentality, that hoarder mentality of I'm going to hang on to things that I don't need just because of some future day when I do need them. Things tend to come back to me. They tend to show up for me when I need them. And so if I don't need this pen and there's some guy over there that needs it, I'm going to let it go. That's the abundance mindset. And if two days later or two years later, I really, really need a pen, I may not get it from that guy, but I'll get it from somewhere else, even if it's from me and my own creative energy figuring out a way to produce a new one. One of my favorite thoughts my dad taught me is that what goes around comes around, but sometimes it comes in a roundabout way. You reap what you sow, but you don't always reap where you sow. And so you have to trust your own creative power. You have to trust the power of generosity that when you let go of what you don't need so that someone else can use it, you never lose. It always comes back to you when you need it. Dude, what you're talking about, I mean, that abundance mindset, everybody wants that. And this is a great way to practice that. It's like practice it with that pen, practice it with your baking sheet. You know, I mean, those are really insignificant things, yeah. but like, if you want to have an abundance mindset, we'll start practicing with, with small stuff like that. I mean, that's my, might be enough leverage to hand over somebody something. And that abundance mindset, you're not going to get more abundance by acquiring more kitchen utensils no. that don't serve you. That's a scarcity mindset. Yes. And you know what? If you're in a scarcity mindset, you're probably going to end up in a scarce situation. And one way to practice that is what Ryan talked about, the spontaneous combustion rule, looking at anything in your home and asking yourself, if this were to spontaneously combust, would I replace it? If so, probably makes sense to keep it. Or maybe even ask another question, okay, why would I replace it? Am I using it, as TK alluded to? Or would I feel relief? Like, oh, you know, I've been holding on to all of these old pots and pans and all these old dishes and all these old coffee cups, whatever they might be. And I would feel relief 
if they spontaneously combusted. So Michelle, check that out. It's in the Minimalist Rule Book. You can download it for free, or if you want the audiobook version, we'd be happy to send that to you as well. Also, one other note, check out episode 334 of the Minimalist Podcast. It is with our friend Max Lugavere. It was called Kitchen Clutter. We'll put a link to that in the show notes over at theminimalists.com slash podcast. What about you? Let us know in the comments what kitchen items are essential for you. And how's it different from the list that I provided? Maybe my list has some things that would be junk for you. Maybe that wooden spoon is too much or you don't drink coffee. So my whole coffee setup would be junk for you. Let us know in the comments. Let's move on to these social media questions. Malabama, Karen from Instagram has a question for us. It's difficult for some people to ask for help without feeling shame or embarrassment that they can't handle things on their own. How do we get better at asking for help when we really need it? Ryan, I need you to help me with this question. TK, TK, Josh needs help with the question. (laughs) I can't believe you guys can't answer this question. (laughs) Let me go ahead and give my thoughts on it. (laughs) Well, you know, one aspect of asking for help that can make it a heck of a lot easier is to ask people who want what's best for you, who actually respect you, and that you trust. I am not of the belief that it is healthy to just go on social media or to just spray out our problems in all directions to anyone who is willing to listen. Not because I don't empathize with the desire to do that, but because I believe that there are many people out there who simply can't be trusted with your story and your concern not necessarily because they're bad people. Yeah, some people do have bad intentions and that's a reality too. But some people just don't have the context. They just don't know you. They don't have any skin in the game. They're not invested in your life. And so you solve half the problem by talking with people for whom a whole bunch of techniques aren't even needed. If I need 50 different techniques to come to you and say, hey brother, I'm struggling with something. And that conversation only works if I word it perfectly, if I set it up perfectly, if I introduce it with a story and all of that. Man, you you clearly can't be the brother I need to talk to, right? The right person to talk to is the person I can go and say, I don't even know how to say it perfectly. And they say, say it poorly. And I'll ask questions when I need to. And I won't assume that I have the right understanding. I'll repeat back to you how you sound to me and you can confirm and we'll move forward that way. That's the person you want to talk to. Start by talking to the right people. I'll pause there because maybe you brothers, now that y'all <laughs> have some time, can help me out. No, yeah. so I thought about like, <laughs> I thought about like, uh, I don't know, man. When I was a kid, my dad would like uh, cut my fingernails with a fingernail clipper and it hurt. And I remember telling him, and he didn't cut him bad. It didn't bleed or anything. I was just a kid, you know? And I remember telling him, like, dad, that hurts. And he was like, he's like, yeah. He's like, you know, you're a kid. He's like, you're, you've only been here for like four or five years, man. He's like, you'll build calluses. Things will hurt less. Relax, you know? And what I what I hear with this Instagram question from Karen is like, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to do something because I'm embarrassed. It's like, go get embarrassed somehow. Random. That's not that you're going to have like, you know, no, um, there's no cost to it. Like go and wear two different earrings, man. Yeah. You know, I started wearing two different socks literally. Cause I'm like, I take myself too seriously and I still wear two different socks mm. because it's just a reminder of, Hey, Nicodemus, don't take yourself too seriously, buddy. Yeah. You know? I, I'm uh, embarrassed for him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's actually the point I want to, I want to talk about the embarrassment thing because embarrassment is, is basically the sign that something is wrong with either your actions, mm-hmm. like, oh, my actions don't align with the person I want to be. But m- more often, it's actually that you, you're, you're, the story you've told yourself mm-hmm. about the actions that you're taking or the story that someone else has told you. I was thinking about when I was working at a restaurant as a teenager, and I remember I have I was I usually would bus tables, but this day they had me waiting tables because someone had called off. So I'm waiting on some tables, and I have to wait on someone who was one of the rich kids at our school, Ryan. And I'm waiting on this rich kid, and then someone else says to me afterward, like, weren't you embarrassed that you had to serve them? <laughs> I said, oh, I didn't, I remember thinking this and I said it out loud. I said, oh, I didn't know I was supposed to be embarrassed. Oh, wow. Oh. And it made me think like, oh no, to me, the embarrassing thing was not having a job. Mm-hmm. And that was also a story that I was telling myself, right? But to me, there was nothing embarrassing because 
my status that I had achieved was from doing hard work. And now Mm. maybe I've clung to that way too much throughout my adult life. Mm. But at the time, I didn't feel embarrassed because I was serving someone else. Mm. I felt a sense of accomplishment. Like, look what I get to do. I get to do this. There's nothing embarrassing about it unless what? I tell myself this is supposed to be embarrassing. And so I could go work washing dishes right now. I wouldn't feel embarrassed about that at all. In fact, no. I would enjoy it. But if I told myself the story that that is an embarrassing thing to do, mm-hmm. who gave me that story? Yes. Well, probably my society, my culture, someone handed that to me and I decided to keep holding on to it. Yeah. Oh, I, man, I, I'm embar- I embarrass myself all the time. Let me tell you, I'm just an embarrassing MFR. <laughs> I uh, I'm trying to keep it as clean as possible. I, I won't drop any F words, I promise. Mm-hmm. Um, no, I think about how when I would embarrass myself before, I'm like, go home, laying down, going to sleep. And I'm like going over the embarrassing. So I'm like, you're so freaking embarrassing, dude. Like you always embarrass yourself, you know? That's my story. Yeah. It's still my story. But now my story is like, oh man, you really embarrassed yourself earlier. Just give him that old, you know, Nicodemus razzle dazzle, that, the, the Nicodemus charm, <laughs> you know. But like, it's, but I still embarrass myself all the time, and it all has to do with like really that story that I tell myself when it happens, and I get to choose the story I tell myself. Whether it, whether you believe it or not, it's like you at least get to tell your brain, like, hey, let's look at it this way. Let's try to look at it this way, you know. I think also what's happening here is the story behind the story. When you feel embarrassed, yeah, that story is, I am not enough. It always comes down to that, the fear of not being enough. And so if you're embarrassed because of the job that you're working at, the job itself isn't inherently embarrassing. It doesn't matter what the job is, by the way. It's embarrassing because you've told yourself a story that you should be embarrassed by. it. You've told yourself a story that you are not enough. And it's one of the greatest lies you've ever been told. And shame then is produced because you do enough things that are embarrassing that you feel guilty about. Then over time, it says something about who you are as a person. But shame is a very low energy emotion. In fact, it's necessarily low energy. When you feel shame, you don't take action. When you feel shame, you don't spread joy. When you feel shame, you're not generous. When you are embarrassed by who you are, it's because you've told yourself that who you are isn't enough. And I should be something different. I should own something different. I'm embarrassed by the car I drive. Mm -hmm. I'm embarrassed by the house that I live in. I'm embarrassed by my friends. I'm embarrassed by my job, by my job title. I'm embarrassed by the amount of money that I take home or that I don't take home. It's all a story you've told yourself that if you improve those things, you would be enough, but you're already enough without those things. I believe it was in the movie Crimson Tide where there's a character who says to Denzel's character, you look like an Ethiopian. And Denzel's character strikes back and says, and you're ignorant enough to think that's an insult. Just because you are ashamed of me doesn't mean I need to be ashamed of myself. Just because you are embarrassed for me doesn't mean I need to be embarrassed for myself. And by the way, this isn't just relevant to the mistakes we make and the failures that bring shame. This also applies to our own successes. Every area of your life that you are legitimately proud of and grateful for, you better believe it, there's someone out there that's embarrassed for you about that because their concept of who you should have been or what success, what form of success looks best on you is different than yours. And so people are always going to be embarrassed for you for the mistakes you make and for the things you're proud about. But you've got to know who you are for yourself. However, when it comes to this kind of stuff, every skill takes practice and you got to take it easy on yourself just because you aren't an expert at what you want to be an expert at today doesn't mean you can't get there eventually with practice. And so if you struggle with embarrassment about your problems, it can even help sometimes to just shine a light on it. When you talk to your loved ones, going to them for advice, you can say, hey, this is difficult for me to talk about. 
to be transparent, I'm feeling a little embarrassed about this. Just naming it and just calling it out can make it a little bit easier. And you you'd also don't have to start with something big. It's just like if you're learning how to invest, you don't start with your life savings. Hopefully you don't even end with that, right? You start with an amount that you can afford to lose. Maybe feel people out. Talk about some problems that are a little easier to talk about that don't feel so risky. If you're talking with someone for the first time, seeking their advice, don't start with the thing that is most personal. Build a chemistry with the people that you go to for advice or for perspective. But all of these things that you need to learn from telling yourself a different story, uncoupling from self-defeating stories, being more forthcoming about when you feel embarrassment, finding the people that you can trust who don't judge you, all of that takes practice. Start small and work your way forward. Yeah. You can get better. Man, dude, I love what you said about like not just leading with what you need most. Because it's almost like it's so much. If I came to you, I'm like, TK, I need to borrow $500. I mean, you probably gave me 500 bucks. But like, if I came to you and I'm like, hey, man, would you be willing to help me out if I asked you for something? And you're like, well, what are you looking for? Like that, I mean, that you're leading someone to where you're at. And that's, there is something really powerful there that you're yeah. talking about, man. Yeah. I'm thinking about this idea of shame and, and embarrassment specifically. Mm-hmm. And it's not real. Embarrassment isn't real. It's something that you've invented. It's something that I've invented. (laughs) If you look at any animal in nature, they're not embarrassed when they poop their pants. They don't even have pants. (laughs) (laughs) I hear what you're saying. (laughs) (laughs) I'm just waiting for the comment that's like, animals don't even wear pants, stupid. (laughs) This makes no sense. (laughs) You know what sucks about holding on to all that embarrassment too and the shame is like, I held on to it because I felt like it would make me embarrass myself less, but I still embarrass myself just as much. I just felt worse about it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think that embarrassment ultimately comes down to this. I'm not worthy of love. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. I'm embarrassed because I want people to like me and the thing I did or the thing I'm doing or my job title or the clothes I wear or the car I drive is embarrassing. And therefore, people won't like me the way I want them to like me, which means what? I am not worthy of your love. Mm. And of course, I'll be worthy of your love if I just upgrade my car or I upgrade my job title or I upgrade my wardrobe. But that never works because those things happen. And yes, I might impress people, But that's also not real. Mm. Just like the embarrassment is not real. When I'm impressed by something in nature, when I see a bird soaring overhead or you see one of those Nat Geo videos of a gazelle running really fast from, well, from someone who's trying to eat it. And all of a sudden you're like, I'm really impressed by that. They're not concerned about impressing me, right? Mm. They're simply doing what they do. And if that impresses me, great. If it embarrasses me, great. If not, that's great too. <laughs> that's so funny, man. I like like sending, um, like I'll send Mahalik an essay that I'm writing and have him, you know, edit it. And there's like some weird little dream world in my head where he's going to respond and go, Nicodemus, oh my God, this is the best thing you've ever written in your life. <laughs> you know, and it's not that I expect it, but it's like, that's the world that I live in. And you know what? Uh, he, this mo- latest round, he's like, hey man, um, put some notes in there and like he shredded it, which is great. That's what I, that's what I, that's what I, that's, that, 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 that's what I really uh, like uh, Mahalik doing. But the thing is, is like, I, and, and I love Mahalik, but I don't care what he thinks about my work. I don't care what he thinks about me. It's like, but, but I know he does, but, but that's not the point. It's like, if he sends it back and shreds it, I don't go, oh, I'm a worse person. I'm like, oh, you're living in a fairy tale land and you really need to learn how to write better. <laughs> in fact, you want that from him. Yeah. If every yeah. time you sent it to him and he was like, wow, boss, great job. This is the best <laughs> thing you've ever written. You wouldn't get anything out of that other than like, oh, I guess I am pretty awesome. And over time, mm-hmm. if someone else then shredded you mm-hmm. rightfully, because you asked for them, you said, "Hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna write this thing. I need some feedback." And they're like, "Man, I've got like 14 things in this one paragraph." Mm. Oh my god! What? But I thought I was perfect. Well, no, 
someone was misleading you before. And now you're going to feel much more embarrassment because you weren't willing to or able to face the truth in the moment when you needed it most. We got a whole lot more to talk about. Let's take a quick pandiculation break. We'll be right back. Welcome back, Alabama. What time is it? You know what time it is. It's time for the lightning round where we answer your questions from TikTok. Yes, indeed. You can follow The Minimalists on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, X, and Threads. We are at The Minimalists on those platforms. Now, during the lightning round, we each have 60 seconds to answer your question with a short, shareable, less than 140 character response. We call them minimal maxims. We put them in the show notes over at theminimalists.com slash podcast so you can copy and share our pithy answers on social media if you'd like. And by the way, you can find all of our minimal maxims at minimalmaxims.com. A lot of people put this as their... Whenever they open up their browser, it's the main page they go to, and you can just refresh and get a new Maxim every time you visit the internet, minimalmaxims.com. Also, if you want our Minimal Maxims in your inbox, every Monday we'll send you our show notes for free. We won't send you spam or junk or advertisements, but we will send you an email with all the show notes, including all of the Minimal Maxims from that week's episode. So each week there's like five or seven or eight or 10 or 12 or 14 Minimal Maxims for the week. We'll start your week off with a bit of simplicity. You can sign up for our email list for free. The minimalists.email is where you go for that. Today's question is from Copa. I tried the minimalist lifestyle, but ended up spending more money. What did I do wrong? TK, what did Copa do wrong? Hmm. I don't want to make you wrong, Copa. Let me tell you what you could do about it. Minimalism is a mindset, not a product. Uh, speaking of products, I got a quote from Michael Jordan I want to share here. <laughs> oh, it's He's not the a greatest basketball players convenient. ever. Did you know that? <laughs> Top seven. <laughs> tell, uh, tell us, tell us the quote from I'm, one of the best basketball players ever. Talk about get. sixty seconds. I'm like sixty seconds from quitting right now. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, uh, a memoir by TK. Hey, go, go ahead and give another sixty seconds. We'll take it more anyway, Malik. <laughs> Go ahead, darling. Misunderstood. Just like Michael Jordan. <laughs> oh, it's My so greatness good. is unappreciated here. It's so good to Just be with Just like you. Michael Jordan. It's so good to be with you guys. <laughs> it sure is. I'm sorry to derail you. Yeah, I, I appreciate it, man. <laughs> you know, hopefully we can edit it up, make it look like you actually love me. <laughs> I don't just love you, TK. I like you, dude. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, here it is. It's not about the shoes. It's about knowing where you're going, not forgetting where you started. It's about having the courage to fail, not breaking when you're broken, taking everything you have been given and making something better. It's about work before glory and what's inside of you. It's doing what they say you can't. It's not about the shoes. It's about what you do in them. It's about being who you're born to be. Mm. For any positive change you want to introduce into your life, there will always be someone somewhere who's willing to sell you a story about how you can't make that change unless you first buy their startup kit. You want to be a minimalist? Buy my product, and then you can become a minimalist. You want to play basketball? You want to do this? No matter what it is, you got to buy my product first. And the real change in life doesn't come from buying people's products. That's the easy part. It's easy to buy the book, to sign up for the course, to purchase the exercise equipment, because that doesn't demand showing up every day to become something, to face our fears and challenges. But that's where the game is played. That's where the magic happens. You don't need to buy something new to become a minimalist. It's about choosing to be who you want to be and eliminating everything that gets in the way of that. Mm. Mm. Ryan Nicodemus, that's a, that's a hard one to follow. What do you got for us? <laughs> Thanks for letting me. Te well, well, it was even TK. harder to deliver, it. you know, with all the, <laughs> all the jokes and the teasing. We do because we love you. <laughs> oh, I'm so embarrassed right now. <laughs> what I got here? Uh, all right, Copa. Can I go? Can I? Am I, am I starting? <clears throat> life living is more rewarding than lifestyle, Copa. What I guess happened, if this isn't like a snarky question, um, if it is, I, I, like I take it as snarky because of this. You see minimalism online and you see all the aesthetics and the nice, beautiful paintings and all the crisp, clean corners, which is great. That's a, that's a style of minimalism, which is awesome. Uh, that will cost you a lot of money. And if that's what you're going after, you are trying to buy a lifestyle. And maybe there are certain lifestyles you can buy. 
But if you are trying to buy yourself a lifestyle, it's not going to be nearly as effective as if you use that lifestyle to inform your decisions, which sounds like you didn't do, Copa. Mm, yeah, the, the life living part, it really stands out to me because what often happens is we form an aesthetic and aesthetics are great and beauty is necessary. Beauty is an essential part of life. But if it's only the beauty with nothing under the surface, then you've bought a lifestyle, but you've avoided living a meaningful life. Yeah. But here's the flip side of the equation. Letting go isn't only free, it's freedom. Of course, spending money isn't wrong. It's like buying a car isn't a wrong thing. It may not be appropriate for you, right? Buying that shirt that you saw in an ad just because it makes you look more minimalist, it's not wrong, but is that the most appropriate use of that money? And so we're going around trying to find happiness by seeking more, buying more, acquiring more, holding on to more. And it reminded me of the Socrates quote. The secret of happiness is found not in seeking more, but in developing the capacity to enjoy living with less. And so living with less does not require that you buy more to live with less. Yes, it's true. Sometimes it will cost you money to minimize or eliminate something. I'm dealing with some mold in my crawl space right now at my house, and we have to pay someone to come out and remediate the mold, to remove the mold so that we can live healthfully. We want to get rid of it. And sometimes you have to pay money to get rid of the clutter in your life. But once you've done that and you start with a clean slate, no number of products that you buy is going to make you more minimalist, just like it's not going to make you more complete. And also buying those things isn't going to extinguish your desires. You buy the Lexus, now you desire the Mercedes. And you buy the Mercedes and maybe now you desire the Bugatti. There's a great quote from the Sufi mystic poet Rumi. He said, I should be suspicious of what I want. And so, Copa, maybe it's about being suspicious of what you want. Do you want that thing because you think that thing is going to make you a minimalist? I assure you, it's not. And in fact, if you're spending more money in order to get more status as a minimalist, well, then you're probably missing the entire point. Let's answer another question here mm. in a moment, Malabama. But first, real quick for right here, right now, here's one thing that's going on in the life of the minimalist. We could finally talk about it, Ryan. You and I owned a coffee shop for eight years. Yeah, man. And now we don't anymore. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we helped found a coffee company called Bandit Coffee in St. Petersburg, Florida. Ryan and I, we went down there to help our friends Joshua Weaver and Sarah Weaver there are these super talented photographers and designers, and they're building this beautiful community space in St. Petersburg, Florida. Yeah. We have some ties to St. Petersburg, Florida, because that's where this whole minimalist journey started for us. My mom lived down there when she died, and that's what kicked off minimalism for us. In fact, our very first tour stop ever, we're in the middle of our 11th tour right now. It's called the Everything Tour. But the very first tour that we ever did, the first tour stop was symbolically in, in mm. St. Petersburg, Florida. Eight yeah. people showed up. It was November of 2011. And well, what a beautiful experience. It kicked off all of these other tours, all of these other things. And so we became really familiar with the city. When my mom was moving da down there, when she lived down there, and she was going through a chemo and radiation. And so we really enjoyed St. Petersburg. And then we had these friends down there. that We want to do something different. We want to do something with the community here. We're not fulfilled by these creative agency jobs that we have. And we want to do something for our community. We want to create a beautiful community space. We're really passionate about coffee. And so maybe the way we can do that is by opening an intentional minimalist coffee shop. I said, great, how can we help? I said, well, we're not sure. Maybe you can help bring some people in when we open the shop. And so Ryan and I, we had just finished uh, filming our documentary, Minimalism. We had a rough cut together and we said, let's premiere it. The very first place ever. We're going to premiere it down in St. Petersburg, Florida at Bandit Coffee Company during their grand opening. So Ryan and I fly down there with hard drive in hand. And when we get there and we're like, all right, we're ready. And they're like, hey, uh, bad news. We don't think we're going to be able to open the shop. What? 
like our last round of funding fell through totally. We're just going to, we're not going to be able to open the shop. And Ryan goes, well, how much money do you need? And they tell us a number and we go back to our hotel and we're talking about it. And it was literally within a thousand dollars of what we both had together in our life savings. So our life savings we had in 2016, we're like, you know what? We really believe in this idea, in this community space, in St. Petersburg as a city. And we believe in Joshua and Sarah Weaver. And so, you know what? Let's take our life savings and we'll put it into this coffee shop. So we bought into a 25% stake in the business. And then over time, we actually expanded. We, we uh, built out a kitchen, turned it into a restaurant as well, a cafe. And so we owned 40% of this coffee shop for the last eight years. And especially the last, in the first two or three years, we participated a lot in the building out of the business because Ryan and I have run retail stores, we've run businesses, we've hired employees, we've managed people and really helping them build that up. And then over time, we, what we realized is this is their own thing. They want to do this on their own. And so we came to an agreement to sell them back our, our 40%. And so you can still check out Bandit Coffee. It's a beautiful minimalist shop down there in St. Petersburg, Florida. We'll put a link to their website in the show notes. They have a beautiful Instagram as well, which we can link to. And Ryan, when I talked to you about this, when we were talking about selling, and you don't get rich off of selling a coffee shop, I can mm. tell you that much. No. Uh, but we actually made our investment back, which mm-hmm. was nice because 90% of small businesses fail within the first 10 years. Yeah. And so we were the 10% that actually made it. And we made a profitable business in a community that we really believed in. When we decided to sell, you said, you know, I feel really good about this, but I also feel kind of sad. (laughs) Can you talk a bit about that? Oh, just, you know, the end of any chapter, the end of any story is always a little sad when it's over, you know? Um, No, it it was just fun to be involved with, you know, Josh and Sarah and like watching them grow that thing and, Man, how cool is it? Like what they've done over the last eight years is unbelievable. And the fact that we could like give them that, you know, just a little bit of a, you know, I wouldn't say push forward. It's almost like they had all this momentum going. They just needed someone to like help them keep the momentum going. And um, I'm very grateful for being part of this over the last eight years. And again, like just watching them evolve that thing. Yeah. Turn into the cafe (sighs) and the food is like just. I know. Top level, amazing. I mean, they've done such an outstanding job from the branding to, I mean, we didn't have a bunch of money to open a coffee shop. So Josh Weaver was just in there building the furniture himself, him and his mm-hmm. dad, his dad's a contractor. And like, they made this stunning minimalist space. And it goes back to that previous question. Like, I tried the minimalist lifestyle, but I ended up spending more money. Well, if you didn't have the money, guess what? Joshua Weaver built these, the the actual fixtures and the furniture. Most of it he built himself. Yeah putting up walls and plumbing and all of these other things that, well, we don't have the money to pay people to do this. Let's Mm. figure out how to do it on our own. It was Mm. a hyper minimalist approach. It really was. Like him and his dad, like they just put their blood, sweat and tears into that. And it's funny, like um, I was down in St. Peter's was years ago and I'm at a restaurant and talking to a gentleman and I told him about Bandit. And he was like, oh, you're one of the owners there. I'm like, yeah. I was like, have you been there? He's like, no, I don't really like it. I'm like, really? You don't like the coffee? He's like, no, coffee's fine. He's like, you just go in there and it's like, you know, it feels like a hipster, minimalist type, you know, whatever. And he said that, and I'm, and <clears throat> it wasn't a judgment. It's not, that's not what he was really doing, but it's funny how when he said that, I legitimately was like, you know what? I really, that place is beautiful. And it's okay that you don't like that aesthetic, but like thinking about how Josh and Sarah and Josh's father, like really, um, I mean, just again, like every single little nook and cranny in there is just like filled with what they're trying to do for the community. And it shows for sure. Yeah, you can see the intentionality in the space. Yeah. You can check it out, banditcoffee.co or uh, banditcoffeeco on Instagram. Let's move over to a fam's question real quick. So we do these Friday afternoon minimal Zooms with our patrons every month, the first Friday of every month. And Malabama's in there in the chat collecting some additional questions. What we do is we, we pop you up on the screen. We answer your questions. Also, you can turn your camera off. You can just be a fly on the wall as well. But you're having a Zoom call with me and Nicodemus and TK and Malabama's there, Professor Sean, Danny Unknown, post-production Peter is there as well. And uh, we just have these Zoom calls and we have these conversations and there's laughter and there's tears and everything in between. You could check that out the first Friday of every month over at Patreon. 
Who has a question for us today, Malabama? This one comes from Luciana. She says, I find it difficult to connect with others when they default to judging me based on the lens they see me through. Any insights on how to get past this? Yeah, the lens they see you through is their lens, right? Judgment exposes the insecurities of the judge. Judgment is a mirror of their own insecurities. It doesn't mean I'm saying that I don't judge. I'm saying that when I do judge and I judge all the time, it's simply holding up a mirror and exposing my insecurities as the judge. <laughs> Makes me think about our friend, TK, who I won't say, who calls me his liberal friend every time that I, I see him. <laughs> and uh, it's funny because I'm not liberal, but um, that's the lens he sees me through. And it, I don't look at that and think, how dare he label me? I seek to understand. I'm like, why does he label me like that? And we get along really well. I love yeah. that man, you know? Um, but, you know, past self me might have been like, why are you calling me? You know, why are you putting a label yeah. on me? You know? And that's yeah. really what he's trying to probably do anyway. And it's how, how he's trying to understand exactly. you. We, yes. And by the way, labels can be really useful and mm -hmm. important until they become stifling or they get in the way. That yeah. same friend calls me conservative. Right. And yeah. And I, I mean, I don't even know how, I mean, I understand, but why he does it now and then maybe it's relative to Ryan, but I certainly don't identify as a conservative. No. And, and so it's interesting to, to hear someone say, and by the way, I would feel the same way if he called me liberal. I'm like, I don't identify as that either. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't picked a side or a team or whatever, mm -hmm. but it helps me understand how he puts us into perspective in a yeah. way. Yeah. That's right. Tricky thing about advice is it's not just about what you can or should do, but it's also about what you personally can handle. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like uh, if someone's coming to you as a financial advisor, you can't just be like, take this amount of money and put it in that. You don't know how much debt they have. You don't know how much risk they can tolerate. Um, some people can afford to invest more. Some people need to pull out, right? And so I, I can't say which one of these you should do, but I can give you three options for how to handle people that see you through the lens of judgment and based on what you can handle, what you can tolerate, you can pick which one of these three options. And they are leave, laugh, or lead. The first leave is you can simply keep moving. If people are interacting with you in a way that isn't characterized by charitable interpretation and good faith, you're not obligated to stand there and just tolerate something that you don't like. You actually need a higher reason, a higher purpose to put up with things that are painful or obnoxious. I do not believe in this idea that just because something is unpleasant, you should force yourself to sit there, take it and tolerate it. No, there better be a good reason for you to endure something unpleasant. Yeah, keep working out even when it's uncomfortable. There's a good reason for that. Is there a good reason for these people to be treating you this way? Um, if not, leave. Go find some better people to hang out with. That is always an option yeah. that's on the table. The yeah. second is laugh. You can find a sense of humor in it. You can choose not to take people and what they say so seriously. You can choose to look at it through the lens of, this really doesn't have any power over me. What this person thinks of me doesn't affect how my family treats me. It doesn't affect my ability to do my job. It doesn't affect my ability to enjoy life. So you can laugh it off, find a sense of humor about it, challenge yourself in that way. The third is to lead. If this person is someone who's willing to learn from you and willing to treat you like an equal in the relationship and they're willing to consider your opinion, you can exercise possibly a positive influence on them by challenging them back, asking them questions like, hey, man, why do you always feel the need to say that about me? Why do you always joke about me in this way? Why do you always make that comment? Why do you always call me your liberal friend or whatever it may be, mm -hmm. right? Or you can push back even more firmly and say, hey, don't call me that, man. Stop calling me that. Mm -hmm. I, I never liked it when you call me that. I appreciate it if you show a little more respect. And you may change that person's life for the better while you get the good feeling of knowing that you stood up for yourself. But you can laugh, you can leave, or you can lead. And it's all based on what you know about yourself and what you can handle. Mm -hmm. Oh, man, we got so much more to talk about. But first, Malabama, what else you got for us? Here's a minimalist insight from one of our listeners. Hey, y'all. It's Iman from Royal Oak, Michigan. I wanted to share a tip with the listeners that I realized after playing the 30-day minimalism game a couple of times. Start the game off with the areas you think you have little to no problems in. For me, it was clothes. I thought I've always been a minimalist in that department, but to my surprise, I was able to get rid of 10 items in the first four days of the month twice. 
So figure out where you think you have the least clutter and start there. I promise that you will still find something to minimize. It also builds momentum nicely as you're not overwhelmed off the bat. Good luck and remember to have fun. All right, y'all, we'll see you on Patreon for the full two-hour maximal edition of episode 430. That's the full episode. Just head on over to patreon.com slash the minimalist or click the link down in the description. By the way, you also get instant access to all of our archives all the way back to episode 001. We've been doing this a long time, Nicodemus. Also, Patreon is now offering free trials so you can test drive our private podcast. Join for seven days for free. And if you're still on the fence, here's a testimonial from one of our lovely Patreon subscribers. State says, what made me become a Patreon supporter was a used copy of Everything That Remains that I found a while back. I enjoyed that book so much that I decided to listen to your public podcast. But... Then I got the real value once I subscribed to the private podcast on Patreon. Wow. State, thank you so much. Uh, I'm glad you found, accidentally found that copy of Everything That Remains. Y'all can join the private podcast for free for seven days. I'm so happy you got to join us today, Nicodemus. Me too, man. So good being here. Y'all can check out RyanNicodemus.com for his monthly mentoring messages. That is our minimal episode for today. If you leave here with just one message, let it be this. Love people and use things. Because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. Bye. Peace. Every little thing you think that you need. Every little thing you think that you need. Every little thing that's just feeding your greed Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it